All right. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Anderson, and then I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Juan Lopez and Dr. Ola Lovingston. Uh, my handlers and the smart folks in the room. <laughs> Uh, I am this week's designated party pooper <laughs> in that I uh, am here to talk about uh, uh, not just OSS, but some of the trade-offs that come of it, right? Um, and by that, I mean, I think we recognize the incredible value that open source offers, right? Not just the stuff itself, but the principles, the approach, right? However, just like everything in life, it's a matter of trade-offs, right? In the case of OSS, the use and convenience of it, the pros, can often come at the cost of cybersecurity. For instance, what if someone out there, say, forks a piece of OSS with a back door into it, right? <laughs> Purely hypothetical, not saying that's happened, right? <laughs> um, and that's a matter of intentionality. There's also the use case of unintentional, right? Just writing bad code, maybe it has some downstream effects that one has yet to realize. And so, I'm a believer in empowering others. Allow me to outline some of those trade-offs today, big picture, as we talk about the OSS maze and the cybersecurity risks of it. So, as an attempted philosopher of consciousness myself, I'm nearly obligated to start here with Descartes, uh, with the quote you see there. We do not describe the world we see. We see the world we can describe. Although, I don't think Descartes actually did say this. But that's not the point. What is visible to us in of itself is a limiting factor to our understanding of the world. Case in point, OSS is no different. So let's start big picture on OSS risks. This is from a recent report, reference shown there on the slide. This is taken from a sample set of code bases, right? As opposed to looking at truly every code base known to man, but you get the point. 96% of code bases are estimated to contain OSS. OSS is fairly prevalent. Case in point, current estimates are 77% of code in use is OSS. Prevalence might be an understatement. 53% of OSS in use contains license conflicts. Again, there's extreme value in OSS. I think we've talked a lot about that this week, right? And clearly, if you don't, but clearly, if you don't know what is uh, the provenance, the licensing of some of that OSS, there can be very real-world consequences, right? Eighty-four percent of code bases contain vulnerabilities, meaning a NIST National Vulnerab da Vulnerability Database (CVE), with seventy-four percent containing high-risk CVEs. Couple that with the average time to disclose a NIST CVE is 30 days. Vulnerability management can be a real challenge. And part of this is the model. It's centralized, which is somewhat the opposite of open source, right? So maybe there's a way we can bring some of the pros of the open source approach to vulnerability management. Because essentially, it's a collective action problem. It's a tragedy of the commons. We all recognize we need things like roads. And if we all are interacting in the same space, fishing of the oceans, every single person in their, in their actions has consequences to the overall landscape, right? Same thing with OSS. And so, what you can see, you can describe. But how do you describe what's not even visible to you, let alone go about addressing it? And so for a second, I know we're mostly developers here, but put yourself in the shoes of someone downstream, a manufacturer, a vendor, a network owner, et cetera. Do they know everything that constitutes their network and infrastructure to include the bedded stuff, the operational technology, the OT? How about what's running on those things? How much of that do they know? Well, I don't want to speak for anyone, but chances are it's probably minimal, let alone what amongst it is OSS. The true challenge when it comes to cybersecurity in OSS is a matter of visibility. 
And I recognize I'm standing here as a government person saying I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, and usually it's Dr. Lopez that gets to make that joke, but I'm the lucky official today. With that said though, DHS s and with CISA has an effort where we're trying to equip personnel, organizations, and agencies with the ability to increase their visibility into OSS amongst their networks and infrastructure so that they can make risk-informed decisions based on these very trade-offs. So first, allow me to demonstrate what I mean by visibility, and then I'll elaborate how we, empower, how we seek to empower others in the matter. So the current state of OSS visibility. We're going top left to bottom right. At the top level, big picture, OSS in the wild. Everyone has access to it to include the source code, and maybe there's some room for improvement in things like the provenance. Next step down, big picture, like the report we talked about. Writ large, OSS is everywhere, potentially vulnerabilities everywhere. Next level down, and we're talking a network here, is each individual thing, a device, an asset, whatever term we prefer. A network being comprised of a series of these devices, assets. Each device contains OSS, even the embedded stuff, the operational technology. Usually many pieces of OSS, 77% of code in use, if we remember. And if you break down a device into its constituent components, it's actually hardware, firmware, software, and more so, multiple pieces of hardware, firmware, software. Plus, Amongst that device, some hardware, firmware, software is dependent on other pieces of hardware, firmware, software, perhaps OSS. And this is important because vulnerabilities themselves can exist not just from the code, but from the dependencies. And we already saw how prevalent vulnerabilities are. Something like the NIST National Vulnerability Database only speaks to the code. It doesn't even go to this level of dependencies. And next level down, well, when I look at my network and all the devices on it, even if I know the level of dependencies, well, which things do I go about addressing first? How do I make those trade-offs and which decisions? Well, this is a value judgment. One I obviously can't make for a network owner. But think open source. What if I can empower them with the ability to make those decisions. And so, we've talked about the scale of the problem, the red circle. We've talked a little bit about the level of the device itself. And sometimes we have a good idea of what's on those things, meaning a bill of material. Although, as we all know, there's some variance in the quality of bills of materials out there. Plus, a lot of times they don't necessarily speak to the level we're talking here, right? Dependencies. Even worse, if it's not the manufacturer putting out the, uh, the bill of materials authoritatively, there's some real uh, concerns about the quality of reverse engineering it, right? And at the last level, the yellow circle, say I as a network owner even have a good understanding of what's on my network. Again, how do I make those trade-offs to figure out which is the true risk what things do I need to look at first? What actions do I need to take here and now? And so what I offer you is the future state of OSS visibility. Most broadly, OSS will always be in the wild, and rightfully so. Again, OSS is not good or bad, though there are some development practices that are better or worse. But the next level of visibility would be in solving this tragedy of the commons, well, which OSS generally sits where? Amongst types of organizations, amongst types of devices, potentially even device make and model. Not because I care per se what OSS is there, but so we can address the collective action problem together. Because what if when a piece of OSS is exploited, i.e. becomes a vulnerability, we could put out near immediately with high confidence 
where that vulnerability sits and how we can actually go about addressing it. Not a value judgment, but clearly that would be a paradigm shift and a significant improvement from 30 days for a vulnerability disclosure. So I have a dream. When a piece of OSS is exploited, i.e. becomes a vulnerability, we have an idea of where that, that piece of OSS generally sits and can help others in addressing the problem. So DHS s and with CISA is trying to help you guys in this problem. First is we're developing this very OSS histogram, i.e. which OSS generally sits where. Additionally, we have an effort where we're trying to develop a framework to empower people with this level of visibility of the OSS amongst their networks and infrastructure. It's the decision trees, the criteria, the comparative analysis of commercial things out there, COTS products, so that anyone would be able to run this regardless of what they want to use, level of resourcing they can dedicate to it, or the level of maturity of their network or infrastructure. With the caveat, there are some bare minimums. And so my last point here, before I hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Lopez, there is a, as a section here, as depicted on the slide by the blue circle, that is out of scope for us, right? And that's the actual network and infrastructure owners using this level of visibility, using the framework, making those risk-informed decisions. It's that saying, right? You can't lead a horse to water, or you can lead a horse to water, but you can't necessarily make him drink. However, we can't even get to that point without first having the visibility. You're doing good, I believe you. Where, <laughs> where can I buy it? <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll take a, a, a quick walk to finish this out. You know, why even do this? You know, we have challenges, like you said, OSS is pervasive. And the problem is we don't have any visibility uh, into that. And we see there is a demand signal. We see some documentation, some reports to kind of quantify that and, and put it on a map to kind of give you some boundaries about how pervasive it is. And so we need this ability to be able to see down to the asset level, get down into the individual libraries, the dependencies, uh, in order to be able to know where to start mitigating, if you need to. You could accept the risk if it's not a critical function. Uh, there is a lack of knowing how to analyze this. Uh, everybody seems to think that the software bill of materials or whatever bomb there is, there's a variety of those, that is sufficient enough. Uh, and it's not. It's, you know, equivalent to reading, you know, you go to the supermarket, pick go down any aisle, pick a product off, and look at the ingredient, the contents of ingredients. And it can tell you it's got a little bit of this, a little bit of that, certain percent, but it can't tell you how when you they're combined together or with another product that might be uh, you know, not good for you, depending on your diet, your age, so on and so forth. So what we're trying to create, uh, to give you an analogy, is the equivalent of being able to have a way to automate that so it can spit you out danger signs of, hey, don't combine these two things. You know, given your individual characteristics or, say, for your organization, given the characteristics of your family, right? Might be five in the house, six in the house, a couple of pets. Given all that, we can automate that and give you a quick assessment. If you combine these things, these two products together, uh, it's going to create a problem for for you as an organization, just to give you an analogy. That's essentially what we're trying to do. So conceptually, conceptually, it seems not a very difficult thing to do. In practice, it's very difficult. You know, right now, organizations that do generate S-bombs, uh, for example, as one of the, that would be the, we have a lot of people putting ingre contents, ingredients on packages, right? But you ask them to give you details of that, they're reluctant to. Uh, part, of, part of that has to do with the legal framework, legal liability that kind of uh, puts them in, and they're not willing to take that risk. 
uh, right now if they don't have to, so on and so forth. So I'm just trying to give you analogies here to kind of walk the dog so you can see what the, the depth of the problem that we're trying to solve. So, and right now, organizations, at the end of the day, we want to try and automate as much as this is possible, uh, put things that already exist. And the framework that we're talking about uh, is designed to take advantage of whatever tools the organization is currently using or can, if they don't, is there an open source tool available that can do one of the functions in the framework, right? So the framework is a process flow with some function blocks, about eight or nine blocks to get from A through Z. You, you're able to use the, the framework with any tool you want for any of those blocks to include open source tools. So timeline here for, for the project, we started in FY23. Uh, we did the, what we call the technical blueprint and we have just prior to coming here, we kind of started into the next phase where we're getting into actually uh, instrumenting portions of that framework to test it out. We're using some of the national labs as a test bed. They're heavily embedded with DOE. They have a lot of IoT, IIoT, medical devices, energy components, green energy equipment. Uh, they have real close ties with the manufacturers, so uh, we have a, a good test bet there to work with to try and uh, prove this out for version 0 0.1. And so we're hoping that this will be useful and sometime uh, this time next year, we'll have kind of a beta run and be able to present, you know, hey, this is how the framework is, is working. These were all the tools we use. And we do have strong uh, relationships and involvement with industry partners that are part of this, that already do a lot of this. Think of the top five vulnerability management, risk management, uh, private sector companies that are out there. They're involved in helping us shape this. It's not a repository. Again, it's designed to put power in the hands of the decision makers. We're not uncovering vulnerabilities, but we're taking a, advantage of their talent, their know-how, on how to present vulnerability and risk management to their customers, we're just giving them, hey, you have this mathematical equation for determining risk. The one variable that you don't have up there that could be potentially very powerful in explaining your risk is the OSS piece, right? The dependencies, the hooks, how they work, where are the vulnerabilities from OSS in that, in that risk equation. And this is the variable we're adding to that risk management piece. So we're not uncovering vulnerabilities. We leave that to the people who know, know how to do that the best. We're just adding simplicity, like I'm saying, adding one more uh, variable to the equation that might or might not be very influential at the end of the day in helping uh, an asset owner or an organization uh, determine how to prioritize mitigating the risk that they have now that they have visibility to OSS, uh, inclusive of everything else they're already considering. With that said, here goes uh, some of our contact information back to you. Uh, Scott? Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, back to Chuck. Chuck? We'll hang around for a minute afterwards to address questions. Uh, we would love to collaborate with anyone on this who uh, thinks they have a role. Um, so please feel free to contact us afterwards. Thank you. Don't everybody clap at the same time. 